Hello everyone. Welcome to the model deployment discussion. In the previous recordings, we have spent time building models, right? We built fully connected neural network models. We built convoluted neural networks models. We built long short term memory networks. We built sequence sequence models. And we also built linear regression, logistic regression models during the first couple of classes. And so far, we have built them. We built in TensorFlow and we also built in Keras. Again, TensorFlow is what happens in the back end, right? When Keras models are getting executed. Now, how do we reuse these models? How do we make these models available for others so that other people can access your models? We already saw how Gen Z models were used, right? How the Da Vinci code analysis was used to make the predictions, right? But how do we make this as part of a production ready application, right? So that people can access your models, so that your uh, web application can keep on updating data and the model keeps on getting updated with the new data. How do we do that, right? So that's exactly what we are going to focus in this particular discussion. Here we are looking at operationalizing all the concepts that we have learned in the previous, what, 20, 25 recordings. Here is where, here are we. In the journey, we are currently focusing on building the TensorFlow model, right? Building, deploying TensorFlow model. Let us see what does a TensorFlow model really contains, right? We've seen saving TensorFlow session, right? We've seen saving or reusing a lot of models, right? What exactly is stored in a model, right? As you guys already know, the foundation to computation in TensorFlow is nothing but a graph. Right, is a collection of nodes, right, or which are nothing but operations, right? And you are looking at using those nodes, right, linking all these nodes together so that the results are passed from one node to another. That's how the processing is happening. So, what is a TensorFlow graph made of? Nodes, which correspond to the tensor operations and the tensor ops, right? We have the variables, constant, placeholders, matmul functions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that is what a typical TensorFlow graph is made of. This we have seen during our first couple of recordings. And if you are, when you are talking about a trained model, when you're looking at a model, right? A model contains two things and two things only, right? Weights and biases, as I already told you in one of our previous recordings, machine learning is nothing but the machine learning weights and biases, right? Your model learning the corresponding weights and biases, right? So that it solves an equation. For it, all the learning, be it translation, be it image recognition, right? Be it prediction, everything is a mathematical problem, right? And it solves a mathematical problem by looking at weights and biases of all the neurons. That's what we have learned in the last 20 recordings, right? Along with weights and biases, the model also stores the graph definition, right? What are the nodes? What are the different nodes in the TensorFlow layers? Right? In each neuron, in each layer, right? What are the different TensorFlow operations that are being performed? And how are they connected? Right? A neuron in uh, neuron A in layer one, right? How is it connected to other neurons? And what are the weights of this connection? So what is the structure? How many layers are there in the model? Is it one convoluted neural network and three fully connected neural network layers? Or is it Three layers of convoluted neural networks and four layers of fully connected neural networks, right? So that structure, right? Basically, these are the only things that a model contains: architecture and weights and biases. It also contains uh, the optimizer value, right? What is the loss value and everything. But in a nutshell, these are the most important things that a model contains, right? And we've already seen saving a model. This is how you save a model. Let's right? create a saver, right? You are creating a saver object, right, where you are calling the saver method, right, and you're going to see, you are saving the entire graph. They were saving the model here, saver dot save, right, the session information, all the tensor of node values, all the weights, biases, right, the atom optimizer, what optimizer is being used, what is the loss function, right, all those values are stored in this particular saver object. And this is how we used, we saved a TensorFlow model. I'm also going to show you, uh, discuss how a Keras model does it. Right, but first, let us understand what how a TensorFlow model gets saved. And what exactly is saved? 
meta and checkpoint files right checkpoint as you can see right checkpoint records so why do you need checkpoints you need checkpoints right just in case the system hangs because in deep learning when you're training a deep learning model the chances of the system coming to a grinding halt are high right you don't know when the system is going to just hang right so that's reason why you frequently checkpoint maybe you checkpoint every hour maybe you checkpoint after every epoch or maybe you checkpoint after every uh, 10 epochs right or when the model hits a certain threshold in the accuracy part of it right you maybe checkpoint at that point of time right optimization values right so there are multiple ways to checkpoint similar to how you used to save your video games when you're playing your video games computer games right each level maybe just because just before you uh, going into a really challenging task maybe at the end of the level right you used to save your progress particularly when you're playing cricket for that matter right cricket game if you those of you play cricket game right so when you know that uh, uh, If, uh, you are going to face stiff opposition you wanted to save your save the progress that you made right in those cases you use check for similar concept you use here right and you also have logs to visualize using tensor board you can go to so these files pf events we have seen during our tensor board discussion right? you can use logs to visualize them right and all the variable tensor values are are saved in this particular fashion model dot data right all the tensor variables the values are stored here right a dot meta contains the info about graph structure that's the info that i was talking about in the previous slide how many layers are there each layer how many neurons are present how the neurons are interconnected with other neurons and other layers right all these things is contained in information meta graph right this is where the info about graph structure actually happens and why multiple checkpoint version we already discussed right so because we don't know when the model uh, when which model at which point of time right the system maybe just misbehaves so that's the reason why we use we take multiple checkpoint versions right now that is about saving the model that is about using checkpoints that is about saving the model so how about restoring the model restoring the model is nothing but how do we use the model how do we reuse the model right this is what we have discussed right so how do we reuse this model for prediction right so how do we do that we use something called import import meta graph right it meets it imports the graph right load variable values it will load all the variable values get new saver dot restore you use restore function to load all the variable values and you use this method import meta graph right to load the meta graph right and you can list out all the ops once you load them new underscore saver you can list out all the ops so right? this is where you have a you have a pre trained model somewhere right and you are trying to use them in a different context altogether this is nothing but transfer learning right we are re, we are using the learning that is obtained from one model right to train and predict the values in a different context altogether right and to train further if you want to train further you need to get a handle of training ops if you guys remember uh, we briefly touched upon this particular concept during our natural language processing discussion right when we are importing the gensim model right we imported the gensim model where we already have the uh, weights associated with each of the sentences the words in movie reviews right and at that point of time we noticed that there was a limitation right that the uh the values the encoding the 50 dimension encoding that is assigned to each of the words in the movie review right only if these words that you are currently analyzing and the words on which the model that you imported right when these words match only then you can pretty much uh, take the imported model into confidence what if there is a mismatch right what if the reviews movie reviews that you are uh analyzing contain words that were not covered by the movie reviews on which the imported model was built right at that point of time i proposed an idea initially when i said right when you have a group of non performing students right not able to work out a project what you do you add a 
intelligent person a hard working person to that project a person who knows right so that if you add these people automatically there will be learning that is transferred among all the non performers and the overall efficiency of the group gets increased right but that concept was not used during our hands on because of the limitation that when we are importing this model we had to just use it as it is right but here is an option to train further you can get a handle of training operations what are the training ops that are there right and you can use that training ops initialize them initialize the weights using that uh, imported model but you can fine tune it right you can further uh, improve right the accuracy of these embeddings that right? maybe the 50 word uh, embedding for the for a particular 50 dimension embedding for a, for a particular word like flower right that came from the pre trained model right maybe that is not the actual embedding maybe there is a better embedding maybe the values can be better because flower was used in a completely different context in the earlier data set the movie review data set and the current movie data set review data set that you have flower might be really used in the right context right in which case you want the flower embedded values to be updated right so that's when you use this training train underscore op method to use get underscore collection you get a handle of training ops and you need you can update it right this is basically you are taking the help of that intelligent person in your group and at the same time even though he is transferring his acumen right his knowledge to all the non performers in the group he also learns something new during that process right maybe he also uh, updates his skill set during the process so that's what exactly what can happen if you get a handle on training ops final right, score that's once you know that model has been shared once you have no once you know that your model has been updated has been trained has been improved then is the time to freeze the model right when you're freezing the model this is what you do right so you can convert variables to constants and you can also selectively choose only some nodes where right in most of the cases you don't want all the nodes all the operations all the intermediate operations you know you're not really interested in right you're in this particular example you're only interested in the accuracy and the predict operations of the node right so this is how you mention graph underscore df is used to retrieve the nodes right and output node names are used to select the useful nodes right scss the session is used to retrieve the weights that's the importance of session in terms of right use the session variable to contain to retrieve all the weights information right finally once you have selected the nodes that you are interested in the operation that you are interested in right now is the time to uh, serialize and dump the output graph to the file system that right? serializing is converting it into byte stream right so how do we serialize that you use write output underscore graph underscore df serialized to string right so the entire information whatever that you have selected right whatever the weights that were updated if indeed you want the weights to be updated for the imported model right all the, the entire information is saved onto the file system right when you use serialize to string right so this is how you actually freeze a model right now so now that how how do you import a frozen model frozen model is something that the model cannot be updated now right the intelligent person who gets added to a group he will not be learning anything new he will only be sharing information he will not be taking any information in the previous case using train underscore op right you could the that person who has joined your group even though he is far better than all of you right he can still learn whereas in once you freeze the model that's it you are no, no longer going to update that model right once you freeze the model this is how you load the graph and weights from the frozen model right you have the file name graph def parse from string because it is stored into a string right in the earlier case you are passing from string right you are you are getting the information back you are deserializing it right and then you import graph def in the current default graph you import it by using import underscore graph underscore def that's the here you are saving it as graph underscore def right now i'm importing that tf dot import graph underscore def and then i'm get i'm getting all the operation names right and then here this is how you get all the tensors in that particular graph graph get tensor by name right you get you can also get the prediction right so you have the accuracy and prediction values right and then you just use them right this is how you use 
uh, the frozen model to predict, right? So you have the graph here. You got the default graph that is there in that frozen model, right? Now you can use that information in to solve your problem. This is transfer learning, right? This is you are solving. You are predicting something. It is like you uh, read. You are importing a model that analyzed all the reviews, all the movie reviews on Rotten Tomatoes website, right? And now you are trying to classify movie reviews on IMDb. This is what you're doing, right? The frozen model is the model that you got from analyzing all the movie reviews on Rotten Tomatoes website, right? And here you are predicting the say, the classification of a review in IMDb. Right? This is how you predict, right? Loading a pre-trained model, transfer learning. Right, this is exactly the. These are exactly the concepts we have. What we have learned so far. Right? We have already seen how do you load a pre-trained model. So all this, where you load a pre-trained model and use that logic to predict in a different context or different problem set, that is nothing but transfer learning. Right, and transfer learning has wide-ranging applications. This is how we learn. Right, so transfer learning is exactly what happens in a regular corporate setting. Right, you don't want people people who are joining your team to learn everything the same way that you have learned. Right, maybe you synthesize your learnings. Maybe you, being the experienced guy, right, guide him in a manner so that he can quickly get up to the speed, or he can maybe learn something that you have never learned. It's just providing the platform, isn't it? Right, so that's where Google Inception model also comes into picture. Right, so Google Inception model is nothing but. It already has analyzed the so Google Inception is a project. Well, let me just show you how the project uh, looks like. Right, so this is Inception V3, right? So it's transfer learning. So what this project Google Inception V3 recognition model has done is that it performed feature extraction, right? From thousands or millions of images. It's image recognition model. It has already performed feature extraction. Right, and then it has done classification part using fully connected and soft max loops. Right, so the classification can be thousands of classes. Right, zebra, dalmatian, dishwasher. Right, so the model extracts general features from input images in the first part and classifies them based on those features in the second part. In transfer learning, when you build a new model to classify your original data set, you reuse this feature extraction part. Right, because Google has already done that analysis on thousands of images. So whenever you are looking at a new image classification data set. Right, maybe it's, it can be something like uh, you take images of all the Hollywood actors and you want to predict the name of the Hollywood actor when, when it's shown image. Right, Google has already done analysis on thousands of actors, thousands of images. Right, you can use the Google Inception model to uh, get the feature extraction information. Right, all the CNN dimension output. Right, you can get that, and maybe then you can uh, connect that to a LSTM network, right? So that your LSTM, the LSTM network is going to your logic, whereas the feature extraction, the encoding part of it is already performed by Google. Right? That's exactly what we mean here. As you can see here, convolution layers fully connected your network. Convolution layers from inception, you are getting it from Google, right? Fully connected network or a RNN LSTM, this is going to be yours. Right? This is what transfer learning is. You are transferring the learning that Google has. Acquired from all these years, similar to the corporate example that we have seen. Right, your manager will not want you guys want you to go through the same grind that he has gone through for coming up to speed on what the organization is doing. Right, the same logic. That is how you use inception learning. Right, so it's a pretty interesting. A lot of development, interesting development that is happening in this particular space, transfer learning. Particularly, and this is one way, right? You can get you can get an edge over not regular data scientists, right? You need not reinvent the wheel, right? Some parts of the wheel have already been invented, and they're just lying there for you to use. And Google has been inventing a lot of wheels over the last twenty years, right? So you can tap into the twenty years of learning that Google has. Right, so that is how you save a model, that is how you use a model, right? All this is good, but how do you deploy a model in production, right? So that's exactly what we're going to see now, right? Because as we promised, we are going to see how we integrate our model with the chatbot. We are going to build a chatbot, Slack chatbot, 
right? So for that, we need our model to be accessed externally. What do I mean externally? So far, as you can see in, in training programs, right? Both the model is stored on the same working directory, right? As the notebook, right? That you are operating in. Say, for example, the Rotten Tomatoes review analysis uh, model, right? Then the model that was built on analysis of Rotten Tomatoes, right? That model is going to be saved in the same home directory as the Jupyter notebook that you are currently writing, right? To classify an IMDb movie review. And there it is. There are two movie review sites, IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes. Right, so that is all good. It's in the same local system, right? Everything is, but in production environment, you can't have everything on the same machine, right? So how do we make your models available to the external world? How do you open your models, models up for other people to use, right? How do you actually deploy it in production? That's what we're going to see now. So these are the two high level steps when it comes to deploying a model in production. production. Step one, you build a Python module for prediction, right? We, we write a build Python module for prediction. Step two, make it available as a web service. Did we write a Python module for production? For prediction? We did, right? This is the model, isn't it? Or oh, this one, right? Translation prediction. You guys remember? Right? We have built a sequence to sequence model. The sequence sequence model where we translated text from English to Hindi, right? We have also done the prediction. How did we do the prediction? By sending the start and end tags, by appending them, right? And if you also remember, right, we also saved the our models, right? If you look at this, we saved the compiler because we want to optimize the values, right? Loss function values. We saved the decoder model, compiler, right? We save the entire encoder model here. So when you're using compiler, right, you're storing that information into encoder model, and then you're saving it into your local machine, local file system, right? Sequence, sequence, encoder, English, Hindi, sequence, sequence, decoder, encoder model, decoder model I've saved, right? And I've also used pickle, right? Pickle to also use tokenizers, right? We also want to tokenize this information. Why do we need tokenize this information? Why can't we just do it with encoder and decoder? Think on that. I'll explain why that is the case. Right, deploying a model in production. Step one, build a Python module for production. Step two, make it available as a web service. This step one, we have already done. We built our Jupyter notebook. And all you need to do is this particular uh, uh, notebook, right? Just download as .py done. Right? And step two is make it available as a web service, right? So how do we make it available as a web service? That is where something called Flask comes into picture, right? You can uh, run, you can make two apps, right? One app running on the browser, communicate with another app using Java client. You can have a mobile, two mobile apps interact with each other, right? So one mobile app containing the uh, input right and other mobile app containing this model prediction right and you can also make a uh, communicate with app to right both the apps using python client right we are going to see this approach where we are going to have an app using browser slack right and we are also going to see how we uh, communicate with another app using java client right java client is nothing but what you see here give it a note Right, so let us see how do we do that. So building a sequence of SQL models for prediction. Generally, after training, you save models. Right, encoder model, decoder model, we have saved. Model.save, file name dot h5. Right, that is how you save the model in Keras. We're not seeing TensorFlow because we are all the models, all the hands-on that we have done, we have covered Keras. Right, so we are going to see how Keras models can be leveraged. Any other information do we need from training module for us to make a prediction? Say, for example, you are you are logged into your Facebook, right? And you are whatever you are typing, you are typing a message, a post in English, and you want that message that you have typed to be translated to Hindi, right? Not by using Google Translate, 
but by using the sequence to sequence model that you have built this model that you want that sentence that you are typing on facebook to be converted into hindi by using this model right this notebook this jupyter notebook code right how do you do what what exactly are the things that you are focusing on how do you do that right you might be saying straight forward right save model software training encoder model decoder model are these the only things that you need or do you need any other info from the training module encoder model decoder model right what are they going to contain they're going to contain the weights they're going to contain the biases they're going to contain the information about the graph as we have seen the architecture where right? the layers in encoder the layers in decoder how many neurons are there the memory right all these values right is there anything else that you need from this jupyter notebook that you have built what about vocabulary vocabulary is also important isn't it right otherwise you this the, your model that you are saving will contain weights and biases and everything but what is that vocabulary what is the syllabus right basically model the models that you saved are like answer sheets right if somebody is going to uh, use your answer sheet evaluate how well you have done they also need to look at the questions right? they also need to look at the syllabus that was uh, part of your answer sheet only then i can evaluate whether whatever answers that you have written are good or great right i need to know the syllabus and the syllabus is nothing but the english tokenizer and the hindi tokenizer right you need this syllabus you need the questions to make sense of the answers right the model cannot uh, be used right unless you also combine tokenizer information right english tokenizer hindi tokenizer you are uh, or you also need configuration parameters like the sequence length the padded sequence all these things right so that's the way we use pickle pickle package to store this information in the in the form of byte string right that's the reason why as you can see here we use pickle.dump right and we got the encoder and decoder the tokenizer kita kira's tokenizer package right you are saving the tokenizer because we also need the syllabus to make sense of the exam that was written by you. right because that's it's the environment that's what exactly what we are taking we are not just taking the weights and biases and the architecture of the layers we are also taking what are the what is the syllabus on which they operate because that's the only way i can make sense of any output that the model is going to come up with if it predicts uh, if it gives out output as let us say numbers right it will give output as 36 what is 36 i need to know in the hindi tokenizer right what value 36 corresponds to right it might also give me uh, some sequence max decoder sequence length right it gives me maybe a sequence of let us say 30 values right a hot and one hot encoded format right because the output from the model is going to be something like this let me just fire up my epic pen right if i just take this uh, particular encoder model and decoder model and i just pass input as how are you right now i need output right and the decoder model will take the input and it will give me the output as something like 36 45 54 right and this is also in one hot encoded format it will be something like uh, uh, 0 0 0 0 0 36 digit will be one rest of the digits will be zero i don't know how do i interpret this as 36 how do i interpret this as 45 right how how do i interpret another value another output right as 45 54 right i don't know what words are they are getting predicted right i don't know what, how what is the length of the sequence for that what we need to know we also need to know the english tokenizer and the hindi tokenizer value that's how i the model can make sense of okay now i understand okay this is a hindi tokenizer and this is the hin, uh, index value of that number in the hindi vocabulary right i'm getting the vocabulary information i'm also knowing the maximum decoder sense decoder sequence length and the minimum uh, the max encoder sequence length so that i can make sense of the sequence right so these are the information this is the information that is useful to us right you're looking at uh, encoder model decoder model which contains weights and biases and the graph information as we have seen from the tensorflow discussion that we had right along with the english token english vocabulary hindi vocabulary and the other configuration parameters that we have imposed
Right, so pickle is one of the options that we have used to save these objects in Python. Now, this is how we build a model as a web service. Right, first step, we load encoder and decoder models. We load tokenizer for English, tokenizer for Hindi. Right, we also have a function to generate palette sequences for English input. Right, we also write a function to generate palette sequences because that's how the model makes sense of it. Right, and then we translate input string using models and tokenizers. Translate it output. Right. First, let first let us see the Python code. Right. So we have already saved. We are saved these models. Right. Now I'm opening a new Python notebook. Right. Where I'm importing load model, and this is where the models that I've saved with an earlier Jupyter notebook. I'm loading them. Right. What is the name of the encoder that I've saved here? Sequence sequence underscore encoder underscore English underscore Hindi. Right. Let me load the encoder. Encoder English in HD5. Decoder underscore model, load model, decoder English in HD5. Right. Now that I've loaded the models, what is the next step? Loading tokenizers for English and Hindi. Now I'm giving the syllabus, right? I'm using pickle to load encoder tokenizer ring. RB is nothing but read in binary mode because it's byte stream files, right? We are the, because we serialize them using pickle. Right? Decoder pickle load, open decoder underscore tokenizer Hindi RB, right? And here we're also defining the configuration parameters because we know it from training. Max encoder sequence length 22, max decoder sequence length equal 27. This is information that we are manually providing. Right? Because this information is not part of the encoder. So we are manually providing them. And we're also writing this function, right? That will help us to uh, understand, interpret the mathematical output that this model is going to provide. Right? And then we're also going to pad. Sequences. So we're going to generate the padded sequences. Yeah, because that's how uh, we decided, right? That's how the model actually learned, and we are recreating that situation. So we are recreating that environment. Encoder sequence, right? Encoder input text, and we are returning the encoder input data. Right? We are generating the padded sequences for the input string. Right? Padding equal to post, which means that you whenever you are having four words and the maximum length of four words in a sentence but the maximum uh, words in a particular sentence are 27, right? Now, zeros will be kept after the four words. 23 zeros will be there, and they'll be following the fourth word. Right, now you're writing a prediction function, import numpy as np, right? And here is where you are writing the decode sentence, right? So how are we doing that? Again, the same logic, nothing, nothing changed. The same code that you've seen here, right? This exact same code. The same code that you have used for prediction, the same code you're seeing here. Right? Define decode underscore sentence, input underscore str, input underscore sequence. First, we are encoding, converting input string to input pilot sequence, get the encoder state values, right? We're getting the initial state values of from the encoder, the final state values, the final hidden output values from the encoder, and we are passing that to the decoder. We are initializing decoder state values, right? And then we are also uh, Provide the target sequence, right? Because it's prediction. How is prediction done? Whenever the it encounters the input word as start, right? Because we're not here, we're not providing Hindi vocabulary as input, because we are, as we discussed earlier also, right? We are not going to give the Hindi uh, textbook, right, as input when you're writing the exam. You don't have the textbook. You just have the sentence, English sentence, and you need to figure out the translation. What is the keyword? Start. The moment start comes in, right? Whatever is the hidden state of the English sentence, right? Couple that with the start tag, and you'll get the next Hindi word, right? And we said the stop loop, we need to have the predicted sentence, why not stop loop, right? As you can see here, decoder model, whatever it is predicting, you're passing the decoder state values, intermediate state values back to the model, right? And then we get the predicted output, predicted word, Length of predicted sentence equal to equal to zero. Decoder initial state values are h comma c, which are nothing but the final output state of uh, output state, output of encoder in both hidden state and self state. Put in the predicted sequence, right? And if you're looking at something like if name equal to equal to main, which may, which means you are going to the main uh, execution part, right? If you are doing the execution part, if I want to print decode sentence, how are you, right? 
इट ऑटोमेटिकल प्रिंट्स आप कैसे है राइट सो दैट मीन्स डी कोड सेंटेंस फंक्शन राइट वंस इट इज एक्सिक्यूटेड वंस यू एक्सिक्यूट द डी कोड सेंटेंस फंक्शन राइट ऑल दिस मॉडल्स विल बी लोडेड राइट एंड दैट्स एक्जैक्टली वर्ड दिस पर्टिकुलर लाइन मीन्स इफ नेम इक्वल टू मेन मीन्स यू एक्चुअली रन द प्रोग्राम रन द प्रोग्राम print decode center how are you and you getting this transfer right so what i have done here i've done nothing right i've just reused loaded models and tokenizers that we have went to great pains in building in our previous recording right i just i didn't do all this training part because i just loaded this model that we saved at that point of time right i didn't do all this uh, prediction layer part because i just loaded the predicted the decoder model encoder model decoder model i just loaded them i just loaded the encoder tokenizers i defined the sequences maximum length parameters i defined a generated the padded sequences and i just call the same prediction function right and then i showed you the output now the next step is to make this available as a web service so far what we have seen is we have seen the first step what is the first step build a python module for prediction right we have built a python module by reusing the models that we have built so it's a so whatever we have discussed so far in this recording right initially we started with saving our models and loading them right and then we learned about building a python module which does which loads these modules that's exactly what we have done so far so far we have just built a python module for prediction that reused the models that we have built in our earlier recordings right now is the time for step 2 what is step 2 you need to make it available as a web service right make it available to people or others as web service right for that we use something called flask right so what flask is flask is nothing but you can import it using a package pip install package you can import flask is a python package using the pip command tool right the lightweight web framework so what it does is the moment you run it right let me show you yeah right so this is how you use flask first things i'm importing sequence to sequence underscore prediction how do it how did i do this how can i write this particular line and when i'm writing this line you're not getting an error right because is this a uh, package available in python by default no what i did is i just downloaded this as dot py file nothing more nothing less right i downloaded this as dot py file and i kept it in my local file system right if i do sequence this is the py file sequence to sequence underscore prediction right one because i downloaded it as a python file it's a module right it's a module that i imported right i'm importing it as model because that's a model right so that's the sequence sequence model what does this python file contain it contains loading other modules saved modules right so basically i'm building a pipeline so here this is how it happens in real world right in real world how it happens is as a data scientist you'll be first uh, building model right both the encoder and decoder models right this is this we have done in this particular jupyter notebook right next step is you build a another python file right that loads these models along with tokenizers configuration parameters and prediction function right this is what you do you you are building another python file right then next step is you import this python file right because this python file contains all the models that were loaded right and then what i'm doing i'm building a web service now what i'm saying what i'm doing uh, this python file right this is the model right this is the model that i'm interested in 
This is a model that has used the encoder models, decoder models that were developed earlier. And this actual model that uses encoder and decoder to make a prediction. Right? And then now I'm using this particular uh, package called Flask, right, to make this model available to general public. How am I doing this? Fairly straightforward, right? From Flask, import Flask, comma request, right? I'm defining an app equal to Flask name, right? So Flask underscore name means I'm defining a app, right? And I'm defining a function, English, Hindi, translate, right? So what, whichever app that refers to this Flask URL, right? So what Flask does is it just gives a, it starts a web server and it sends a URL to your model, right? And whenever an external app is referring to this, because that's exactly what we were discussing here. Right? Whenever there is an app that refers to this uh, uh, URL, right? because Flask is going to give a web service, web server, right? We'll start a web server on a particular port number and it is going to give you a web server URL, right? And any app that refers to the web server URL, right, will be able to access your model, right? So what it is doing, look at this, English in the translate, right? Um, extract the username, request.form username, text equal to whatever is that text, right? Who, who is that user who is requesting this URL, uh, who's accessing my model, and what is the text? This is part of his request, right? And then Hindi translation, here is the Hindi translation of your input, right? If, if the URL doesn't, if the model doesn't understand the input, because this is where the te text is nothing but the input that is coming, right? Like, how are you? Because it's English to Hindi, right? How are you? If you're typing, how are you in uh, Facebook or in Slack, right? that is going to be stored in the form of text. And your ID will be username, right? And then it will return, hi, username.title. It will say, hi, say if I'm typing it, hi, Sai, right? And in the translation, right? And when I execute this, as you can see, it is still running when I started this, right? It is running on this particular port number. This is the web server URL, 5000 port, right? So by default, it starts on 5000 port, but you can modify the port number also. Right, so this is my, so Flask has given me a web server URL. So this is the URL. Right, right now it says bad request because I didn't give any context for this, right? But what it has done is this URL, right? Is the URL that can be, that will be used to access this model that I have built. That sequence to sequence prediction model that I've built. Now I made it available to everybody, to the outside world. Right, using this particular URL 127.0.0.1, Python 127.0.01 is nothing but local host. But then again, is that really true? Did I really make my model available to everybody else? Right, how can a chatbot access this URL? Right, is this, is this the right URL? Or should I do any more modifications to this? Right, that's exactly what we're going to see in the next recording. So in this recording, what we have seen, we have seen how we can save the models, how we can load the models, and how we can use Flask to build a web service for our model so that other applications can access it. How other applications can access it, to be more precise, how Slack can access this URL and perform this translation, that's what we're going to see in the next recording. Okay, to recap what we have done, particularly on the Flask front, right, we imported whatever model that we have built, where this is nothing but this particular code, so you can see it's a Python file, and this Python file contains loading the models, loading the encoder, loading the decoder, right, loading the tokenizers, loading the, defining the configuration parameters, and the logic for prediction function, and all this is pretty much straightforward that we have covered in the earlier code, snippet, code snippets also, right, and then, what we have done, we have defined that, we've defined a function, English, Hindi, translate, right? And whenever uh, an application, right, gets or po posts at the context truth, right? You just perform the Hindi translation for the text, right? That's the reason why you said model.decode underscore sentence text, right? How does it know that uh, it has to call the decode underscore sentence method that you mentioned here? Because this is part of the model, sequence sequence prediction, Right, I've loaded it as the model. And that's how it is going to call that method that we have loaded in the model. But in the next recording, we'll see how 
Slack can leverage this information and call this application. Until then, this is Sai signing off.